بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last week we covered the battle of Uhud from the beginning until the end and so we looked at how the battle started and how the Muslims initially were winning and Quraysh started to retreat after their initial defeat but then the group that Rasulullah sallallahu had instructed not to come down from the hill out of their joy seeing that the Muslims were victorious they forgot about those instructions and they came down thus allowing Khalid ibn al-Walid who was the commander uh, in the army of Quraysh to come from around and attack the Muslims from behind and so this led to the Muslims becoming sandwiched between both the front and the back and so it led to many casualties from among the companions in fact even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was injured as a result and then we spoke about how he managed to retreat with some of his companions they retreated to the mountain and that is where they stayed and so only a few from among the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam remained steadfast with him fought with him until the very end now we also looked at some heroic scenes from this battle last week scenes of courage and sacrifice on the part of the companions like that of Abu Dujana عن, and the seven Ansaris who came forward to protect the life of the Prophet ﷺ when he came under attack. And so tonight what we want to do is we want to dedicate our time to talk more about the sacrifices of the companions on that day. And our focus will be on what made this battle special. And that is the shuhada among them those who fell as martyrs from among the companions on that day and so 70 Muslims fell shaheed in the battle of Uhud it was in the battle of Uhud that the verses talking about martyrdom and about shahada were revealed and many a hadith from the Prophet وسلم, talking about the reward of the shaheed and the virtues of martyrdom were stated in reference to this battle. And so we start by asking who is the shaheed? You know, what defines the shaheed? The shaheed specifically is the one who dies fighting the enemy but that doesn't mean that they are the only shuhada and so the Prophet وسلم, mentioned others who are also considered shaheed however the difference between the two is that the shaheed who dies on the battlefield he is a shaheed in this dunya and the next 
Whereas the shaheed who is not killed on the battlefield, and the Prophet ﷺ gave us many examples like someone who dies defending himself or his wealth, someone who dies from the ta'un, from the plague, someone who dies from an abdominal disease in the stomach, al-mabtun, someone who drowns, and so on and so forth. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned different individuals who are considered shaheed. However, they are only shaheed in the akhirah. They get the reward of the shaheed in the akhirah. In terms of this dunya, they are dealt with like any other Muslim in the sense that we give them a proper burial, a proper janazah, we wash their body, we shroud them, and so on and so forth. Whereas the shaheed who dies on the battlefield, as we will see today, None of those rulings apply to him. However, it's important to note that when we talk about the shuhada, saying that they have died or that they are dead, these are not the right words to use because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade us from them. As we will come to later. Allah said, don't call them, don't say that they have died but rather they are alive. So if we do use it, you know, if we do mention, okay, so-and-so, he died or he was killed, uh, we don't mean it in the real sense. But just so that we understand what we're talking about, dead in the worldly sense. And so let us go through the stories of some of the shuhada from the battle of Uhud. We start with the main shaheed who was referred to as Sayyid al-Shuhada the master of the martyrs and he was also known as Asadullah the lion of Allah and that is the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiyallahu anh Two of the tabi'een went to visit the killer of Hamza radiallahu anh after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They went to visit Wahshi who was old at that time. They wanted to hear the story of him killing Hamza radiallahu anh. And so Wahshi he said, I will narrate to you the story as I narrated it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when I met him and he asked me about it. He says, I was a slave of Jubair ibn Mut'im in Mecca whose uncle Tu'ayma ibn Adi was killed in the battle of Badr. And so when Quraysh went out to fight in Uhud, Jubair, my master, he came to me and he said, if you kill Hamza in revenge for my uncle's death, I will set you free. So I went with the army of Quraysh. I was an Abyssinian and I could throw my spear like my countrymen. I rarely miss my target. And so when the forces met in battle, I went looking for Hamza and I waited for him. And so amidst the fray, I found what looked like an enormous camel striking out viciously at our men with his sword. Nothing stopping him. And so that was Hamza radiallahu anhu. He says, I made use of bushes and rocks to hide behind to get close to him and then I waited for the perfect opportunity as Hamza was there and so I aimed my spear carefully and when I was sure of it I threw it at him he says it struck below his navel and emerged between his legs he tried to move towards me but he couldn't. I left him with the spear until he died. Then I went over to him. I retrieved my spear 
and returned to base where I stayed. I had no business with anyone else other than him. I only killed him to gain my freedom. So now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard the news of the death of his uncle. And we cannot imagine how devastated this news was for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hamza radiallahu an was extremely close to him and beloved to him. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked, did anyone see my uncle? Where is he? And so one of the Sahaba radiallahu an he spoke up and he said he had seen him. So he took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they went together until they came to his body. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cried. Hamza's stomach was open and his insides were pulled out. And so the man who, the Sahabi who took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there, he says, Ya Rasulullah, by Allah, this is not how, how I saw him. He has been mutilated. Meaning, when he saw him, he was not like this. He was simply killed with the spear. And so, the story behind that was that the wife of Abu Sufyan, now last week, we mentioned Towards the end of the battle, Abu Sufyan came to the place where the Prophet ﷺ was hiding in the mountain and there was a conversation between the Muslims and him. One of the things he said was that some of your men have been mutilated. Their body parts have been cut up. He said, Abu Sufyan said, <coughs> he said, I did not order that. But neither did it bother me. So what he was referring to was this. His wife, Hind bin Utbah, she wanted to take revenge because Hamza had killed her uncle in the Battle of Badr. So she wanted to eat the liver of Hamza. And in some narrations, it mentions that she pulled it out and she tried to eat it raw, and she spit it out. And so this was a state in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa found his uncle Hamza. And so we cannot imagine how grieved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was. In fact, in one narration when he saw him, he cried and he said, I will never be afflicted by anything as I have been by your death. Like someone whose mother or father passes away. That's how the Prophet ﷺ had felt. Anyways, Wahshi, he continues the story. He says, I went back to Mecca and I was now a free man. But I remained there in Mecca until the Messenger of Allah had come and conquered Mecca. I then fled to Ta'if where I stayed. And when the people of Ta'if sent a delegation to Mecca to meet the Prophet wasallam to accept Islam, I didn't know what to do. Because here Wahshi is trying to flee from the Prophet He knows how grieved the Prophet was, how devastated he was by what he had done. So he says, I told people, perhaps I'll go to Syria, I'll go to Yemen or some other country. I was in a state of indecision and anxiety when someone came to me and told me, come on, I swear he won't kill anyone who has accepted his religion and testified to the truth. 
And we know and we will see when we come to that event in the seerah, Fatah Mecca, the conquest of Mecca, that the Prophet ﷺ had announced on that day that he is not going to take revenge and he gave a general amnesty to everyone. And so the Prophet ﷺ was known for his forgiveness, his forbearance, his mercy. And so this man was telling Wahshi that if he becomes a Muslim, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa will not touch him, will not harm him. And so Wahshi, he goes on, he says, when he told me that, I went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in Medina. I entered, surprising him, standing before him, and saying the shahada. When he saw me, he asked me, are you Wahshi? And so I replied, yes, O Messenger of Allah. He then says, sit down and tell me the story of how you killed Hamza. Wahshi says, and remember he's speaking to these two tabi'een. He says, I related it to him as I did to both of you. When I finished my account, my story, to the Prophet the Prophet said to me, Wahshi, please turn your face away from me. I don't want to see you. And so the Prophet did not want to see him because it would bring, bring back memories of his uncle Hamza. And then Wahshi says, and so I used to avoid Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wherever he may be so that he would not see me and eventually Allah took him to himself meaning until he passed away. The next shaheed that we move on to from the battle of Uhud is the one we mentioned last week who was the flag bearer who had the flag of the Muslims in his hand and that was who was that? we mentioned last week Mus'ab ibn Umair Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu anh. now we mentioned Mus'ab ibn Umair previously when we mentioned the story of the Hijrah and so Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu an came from a very rich family from Quraysh. And he used to live a very luxurious life. And he left all of that to migrate to Medina and he lived in poverty in Medina. And so he was killed in the battle of Uhud, leaving nothing but a cloak. Meaning that's the only possession, that's the only thing that he left behind in the dunya. And so they tried to use that cloak to shroud him, to cover his body. And so when they covered his head with it, his feet would show. When they covered his feet, his head would show. And so the Prophet ﷺ ordered his head to be covered with the cloak and some leaves put over his feet. Now Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu an, one of the wealthy companions, one day food was served to him. And he said, Mus'ab was killed, yet he was better than me. There was nothing to shroud him except a cloak. And then he says, Hamza was killed, yet he was better than me. Also, there was nothing to shroud him in except a cloak. And then he said, I'm afraid that our reward has come too soon in this worldly life. He then cried until he forgot about his food. What he was trying to say is that these companions left this dunya without having tasted the reward of their jihad in this dunya in terms of worldly possessions and the reward that the Sahaba, the other companions enjoyed 
even after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu when all of these spoils of war came and they became so rich, etc. And so Abdurrahman ibn Awf was one of them. Instead, these companions, they are enjoying their reward in the Akhirah. He was saying, on the other hand, we are enjoying the reward in this dunya. And maybe because of that, <coughs> maybe because of that, we will end up missing out on the reward in the Akhirah. Also, among the notable shuhada of Uhud was Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah. Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah was one of the leaders of the Ansar. Remember, we mentioned him last week. He was the one who the Prophet ﷺ went to and told him about Quraysh advancing to Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ told him to keep it a secret. And so Rasulullah wanted to know what happened to him. He was one of the leaders of the Ansar. And so he asked who will find out for me what happened to Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah, whether he is alive or dead. So one of the Ansar, he went looking for him. The Prophet ﷺ told him, if you find him alive, give him my salam. And so when he went, he found Sa'ad in his last moments. And he told him, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has sent me to you. Are you dead or are you alive? Sa'ad said, I am among the dead. Inform Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah says to you, O Messenger of Allah, may Allah reward you on, a, on our account better than he has ever rewarded any prophet on account of his ummah. And then he said to the Ansari, he said, go and greet your people, meaning the Ansar, and tell them that Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah says to you, remember Sa'ad is one of the leaders of the Ansar. He says, go and tell your people, do not forget about your pledge to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you gave to him on the night of Aqaba. Remember, the Ansar left Medina and gave pledge to the Prophet sallallahu And it was based on that pledge that he migrated to Medina. And that pledge was that we will be with you and we will protect you and we will defend you. He says, tell them, don't forget about that pledge and you will find no excuse with Allah if harm comes to your Prophet while you still have, while you still have one eye to blink. And so this was Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah. We move on to Abdullah ibn Jahsh radiallahu anhu. Before the battle, Abdullah ibn Jahsh met with Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And Abdullah ibn Jahsh, he said, let us make dua. So they go together. One of them was going to make a dua and the other one was going to say, Ameen. And then the other one was going to make a dua and the other one was going to say, Ameen. So Sa'ad ibn Waqqas, he begins, he makes his dua, he says, Oh Allah, if I meet the enemy, then allow me to fight a strong fighter who will fight me and I will fight him and then give me victory over him and enable me to kill him and take his armor. So Abdullah ibn Jahsh, he said, Ameen. Fair enough. That's a good dua. And then Sa'ad said, now it's your turn. And so Abdullah ibn Jahsh, he says, Oh Allah, enable me to meet a strong fighter who would fight me and I will fight him. And then he will kill me 
and cut my nose and ear. So that when I meet you, O Allah, you will ask me, why was your ear and nose cut, O Abdullah? And so I will say, for you and your messenger. And you will say, you are speaking the truth. And so Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, he said, Ameen. Later on, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was narrating this story to his son. He says, my son, the dua of Abdullah was better than mine. By the end of the day, I saw his nose and his ear cut off and tied to a piece of string. Allah accepted the dua of Abdullah ibn Jahsh and he did indeed meet a strong man who fought him and killed him. His body was then mutilated, his nose and ear was cut and they were tied to a string. And so this was part of what Quraysh had done. They had mutilated the bodies of the companions. After that we have Khaythama Abu Sa'ad. Khaythama was an old man, but he still wanted to fight. Even though anyone of his age was excused. However, his son had fought in the battle of Badr and was killed. Khaythama, he said, I missed the battle of Badr and I was so eager to join, meaning Badr, but me and my son, we drew lots. Imagine, father and son both wanting to go out to fight, but both of them couldn't go because one had to stay behind to take care of the family. So they drew lots. And it came out in favor of the son. He says, he went and he was, he was killed in the battle of Badr. So Khaythama radiallahu an, he says, I came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and I said, I saw him last night in my sleep, meaning my son. He looked great and he was enjoying the fruits of Jannah. He told me, come and be my companion in Jannah. I have found what Allah has promised to be true. So, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I swear by Allah, I am so eager to join him in Jannah. I am old, my bones are soft, and I want to meet my Lord. So ask Allah, O Messenger of Allah, ask Allah to award me with shahada, with martyrdom, and to allow me to join Sa'ad in Jannah. So Khaythama radiallahu an, he was saying that he's getting old, and that if he doesn't fight now, then he's afraid he's going to die a natural death. He's going to die on his bed instead of dying as a shaheed. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did make dua for him that Allah grants him shahada and he did indeed die as a shaheed in the battle of Uhud. After that we have Wahb al-Muzani. Wahb was not from Medina. The tribe of Muzayna was from outside of Medina. And he and his relatives were shepherds. So they came to Medina to graze their sheep that morning. And they found Medina to be empty. So when they asked where everyone is, they were told that they have gone to fight Quraysh. And so they left their sheep and they joined the battle. They arrived when the Muslims were winning. But then when they started fighting, that is when the tide had turned and chaos you know, started in the ranks of the Muslims. And we mentioned what ended up happening. 
And so, Wahab al-Muzani and whoever was with him, they carried on fighting. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw a group of the enemy approaching. So he asked, who will take care of this group? Wahab al-Muzani, he said, I will. So he advances and attacks them and he pushes them back. A second group comes and Wahab, he comes again and he volunteers. He stops the men and he pushes them back. The third time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he says to him, go and receive the glad tidings of Jannah. So he went, he fought attacking this huge group. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw this and he said, oh Allah have mercy upon him. He was outnumbered, but he carried on fighting until the swords of the enemy shredded him and he was killed. When they found his body afterwards, they had found 20 fatal injuries. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, عنه, he says, that is the best death that I could wish for. That is how Umar عنه, wanted to die. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was the commander of the Muslim army in the battle of Qadisiyah. This was years after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was a huge battle in which the Muslims were victorious over the Persians. After that battle, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was approached by a man from Muzayna. His name was Bilal. He was basically saying that some of my relatives did not get a share of the booty in this war, in, in, in the Battle of Qadisiyah. So Sa'ad, he said, you're from Muzayna. Are you a relative of Wahab al-Muzani? He said, yes, I am his nephew. Imagine this whole event is happening 13 years after the Battle of Uhud. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas says to him, On that day when Rasulullah was asking for volunteers, it was your uncle who was attacking them all. Every time the Prophet would ask for volunteers, he would go forward. The third time, I went and joined him because I wanted to receive the same reward that he would receive because I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, have the glad tidings of Jannah. And so Sa'ad mentioned how brave and courageous Wahab was until he was killed. So Sa'ad, he says, no state of death would I love to meet Allah with more than the state of the death of Wahab. He said when he was killed after the battle was over, I saw Rasulullah stand over his grave when they were digging it and waiting right there until the burial was over. Even though Rasulullah was extremely exhausted. And so the Prophet was injured, he was tired, he could barely stand up, but he stood at the grave of Wahab al-Muzani until he was buried and then he said oh Allah be pleased with him because I am pleased with him and then we have Amr ibn Jamuh radiallahu anh Amr ibn Jamuh was disabled He had a limp in his foot. He couldn't even walk properly. He had four sons who fought in the battle of Badr like lions alongside Rasulullah When it came for the battle of Uhud, 
they tried to hold him back. Their father, who's disabled, he was saying, I want to go too. And they were saying, Allah has excused you. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, my sons want to restrain me and hold me back from going to battle with you. But by Allah, I want to step this disabled foot of mine into Jannah. Rasulullah said to him, it's not obligatory for you to fight. You're disabled. You're excused. But then Rasulullah turned to his sons and said, it is not your duty to stop him. If he wants to fight, let him go. Allah may perhaps grant him shahada. Allah perhaps may grant him martyrdom. So he went and he fought and he died as a shaheed. And so this shows us that <clears throat> it is allowed for someone to go out for jihad even if it's not mandatory upon them. And this also shows us how eager the companions were to die fighting fi sabilillah. After that we have Anas ibn al-Nadhar radiallahu anhu. He was from the Ansar and he was the uncle of Anas ibn Malik. He had missed out on the battle of Badr, so he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and said, O Messenger of Allah, I was absent from the battle, the first battle that you fought with the Mushrikun. By Allah, if Allah gives me a chance to fight them, I will show Allah what I can do. And so when the battle of Uhud came, he entered the battle and he fought until the tides had turned. So now the tides had turned. We mentioned last week when this happened, the Muslims split into three groups. One group, they stopped fighting and they sat down on the side. They had thought the Prophet ﷺ has been killed. There's no point in continuing. And so, Anas, he saw this group. He saw them and then he said, Oh Allah, I seek your pardon for what these people have done, meaning these Muslims. And I free myself from what these people have done, meaning the Mushrikun. And then he turned to his companion Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and he says, Oh Sa'ad, I smell the smell of Jannah, the scent of Jannah. I can smell it from the direction of Uhud. And then he entered the fray and he fought until he was killed. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I was not able to do what Anas had done. When they found his body after the battle, there were more than 80 wounds of swords and arrows. In fact, nobody even knew whose body it was until his sister came and recognized that it was him by his fingers. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed regarding him and the others who were killed in the battle of Uhud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرْ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلَ It is said that this ayah was revealed regarding him and the other shuhada. Allah says, among the believers are men who are true to what they promised Allah. Some of them have fulfilled their pledge, meaning with their lives. 
while others are waiting their turn. They did not change their commitment in the least. All right, there's many stories, but we'll mention one last story. And that is another famous companion who was killed in the Battle of Uhud, and that is Hanzalah ibn Abi Amir. Hanzala was from the Ansar. And his situation was unique. He had just gotten married the day before. And so the night before the battle, it is his first night with his wife. But the night before the battle was also the time when usually the Mujahideen and the companions would spend that time at base with the Prophet ﷺ. So Hanzala came to the Prophet ﷺ and sought his permission, saying, Ya Rasulullah, let me spend this night with my wife. And so he does that. Early in the morning, he goes and he prays Fajr with the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, but his wife wanted to come back to him. So he goes back home and his wife, she says, you know, I want you to be with me. And so they had an intimate relation and he gets up and he goes to the battle just like that. And so he forgot to do ghusl. He went like that in this state of ritual impurity. Now, Hamzana was a foot soldier. He was not on a horse. He sees Abu Sufyan and he attacks him. Abu Sufyan was on a horse. So Hamzana was at a disadvantage. But he managed to attack Abu Sufyan. And he brought him to the ground and he was about to kill him. When one of the enemy soldiers, he saw this and he attacked Hanzala with a spear. And so it entered through his torso and came out from the other side. Hanzala not giving up, he tried to pursue the man who struck him. And so that man, he attacked him again and hit him a second time. And this time it was fatal. And that was it, Hanzala. He was killed on the spot. Now, after the battle was over, Rasulullah saw something strange. So he told someone to go and ask Hamdullah's wife about him. So they go and they ask him, and they, they ask her, and this was Jamila. The daughter of Abdullah ibn Ubay. Abdullah ibn Ubay was the leader of the munafiqun, of the hypocrites. But although he was so evil, two of his children were companions and they were very righteous. A son and a daughter. Jamila and Abdullah. Anyways, they go and they talk to her and... She says that he left without making ghusl. He left in the state of spiritual impurity. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he says, when he heard about this, he says, that is why I saw Hamzala right there between the sky and the earth being carried away by the angels and they were washing him with water from Jannah in vessels of silver. And so the angels came down to wash Hamdala radiallahu an, And that is why he ended up having a title. And that is Ghasil al-Malaika. The one who was washed by the angels. Now I said we'll mention one last one, but we'll, we'll conclude with one more. And that is Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram, he told his son, 
that you are the dearest thing to me in this world after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I would have wished you to die as a shaheed, but I want you to take care of your sisters and pay off my debt. Who was his son? His son was Jabir ibn Abdullah, a famous companion. And so that is why Jabir stayed behind in Medina and did not participate in the Battle of Uhud. So anyways, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram, he goes to the battle and he's killed. And his son Jabir and his family gathers around him and they were weeping because of the loss of their father. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them, whether you weep or you don't weep, the angels went on shading him with their wings until you had lifted him up. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was saying that it doesn't make a difference whether you cry or not. Abdullah, he is happy. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meets Jabir and says, Shall I give you some glad tidings? Allah greeted your father right there at Uhud where he was struck down. And then he asks him, What is your wish, O Abdullah? Abdullah replies, To return to the dunya so that I can fight again and then be killed once more. No one, absolutely no one wants to go back to the dunya except for the shaheed. The moment of death is painful for everyone except for the shaheed. It is nothing but pleasure. In fact, as the Prophet ﷺ mentions in one hadith, the shaheed at the time of death, he doesn't feel any pain more than the prick or the bite of an ant. That's it. Now, after the battle, the Prophet ﷺ, speaking about the shuhada who were martyred, he said, I bear witness that these are shuhada, so come and visit them in the name of the one whose, soul, whose hands my soul is. Anyone who gives them salam up until the Day of Judgment, they would respond back to it. And so they are alive. And when you go and give them salam, they would return your salam. And that's why if any of us was to ever go to Medina, we should make it a point to go and visit the shuhada of Uhud. And say salam to them just like we would say salam to any, anyone else who is in their grave. The Prophet ﷺ also said, speaking to the companions. When your brothers were struck down at the battle of Uhud, Allah placed their souls in the crops of green birds, which go down to the rivers of Jannah, eat the fruits of Jannah, and then nestle in chandeliers of gold, hanging by the throne of Allah. Then, when they experience the sweetness of their food, and they drink and they rest, they ask, who will go back to our brothers, meaning in the dunya? Who will go back to our brothers in the dunya who fought with us, but did not receive what we have received? Who will go to them and tell them that we are alive in Jannah being provided for? So that they don't become disinterested in jihad and draw back from fighting <coughs> because naturally fighting in battle is something that we naturally dislike as Allah said Kutiba wa huwa kurhul lakum. the first time that Allah said that fighting is prescribed for you Allah said even though you may dislike it and so when these shuhada said that, Allah said, 
I will tell them on your behalf. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he says, and so Allah sent down the following ayat from Surah Ali Imran. ولا تحسبن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أمواتا بل أحياء عند ربهم يرزقون Don't think of those who have been martyred in the path of Allah. Don't say that they are dead. Don't think that they are dead. In fact, they are alive with their Lord, well provided for. فرحين بما آتاهم الله من فضله ويستبشرون بالذين لم يلحقوا بهم من خلفهم ألا خوف عليهم وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Rejoicing in Allah's bounties and being delighted for those who are yet to join them. Right? Allah is telling us about these companions. That they're there in Jannah and they're waiting for they're waiting for their companions. Delighted for those who are yet to join them. That there will be no fear on them nor will they grieve. يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِنِعْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَفَضْلٍ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ They are joyful for receiving Allah's grace and bounty and that Allah does not deny the reward of the believers. And so the shuhada, they wanted someone to encourage their brothers back on earth to continue fighting in the path of Allah and not to be reluctant. And so Allah said that He will do that. And thus, he reveals these ayat. And so, this bond of brotherhood was so special between the companions and the mujahideen that they wanted to convey this message to them. And so the shuhada were so eager to convey this message that Allah conveyed it on their behalf, revealing these ayat that are going to be recited all the way until the last day giving reassurance to anyone who is fighting in the path of Allah that they should continue and they should not give up because it's either victory in this dunya or it is shahada, martyrdom which is the eventual victory and the true victory in another narration in Sahih Muslim Masruq, one of the tabi'een, he says, we asked Abdullah ibn Abbas about the ayah, this ayah. Never think of those who are martyred in the cause of Allah, that they are dead. He said, Abdullah ibn Abbas said, we also asked what this ayah means. We asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, the souls of the martyrs live in the bodies of green birds who have their nests in chandeliers hung from the throne of Allah. They eat the fruits of Jannah from wherever they like, and then they nestle in these chandeliers. Once their Lord looks at them, He asks, do you want anything? They say, what more should we desire? We eat from the fruit of Jannah from wherever we like. And so Allah asks them the same question a second time. And they respond in the same way. What more could we possibly want, O oh Allah? Then a third time, when they see that they would continuously be asked until they give an answer to Allah, something that they want, then they say, O oh Allah, we wish that you can return our souls to our bodies so that we can go back to the dunya and be slain for your cause once again. <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ says, when Allah saw that they had no other need besides this, He left them to enjoy themselves in Jannah. And so these are only some of the virtues and the rewards of the shaheed in the Akhirah. Now we come to one last thing that we'll mention today, and that is, what happened to the bodies of these shuhada? And so it is sunnah 
to bury a shaheed wherever he dies and not to move them to a different location. When some of the companions were taking the bodies with them to Medina, because they thought it's better for us to go to Medina, we can bury them in Baqiyah, next to us. The Prophet ﷺ told them, return them and bury them at Uhud. And so that is where their, their graveyard is, their cemetery is, until this very day. And so, in Sahih al-Bukhari, Jabir radiallahu anhi narrates, he says, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would place one shroud over each two of the men killed at Uhud. So, in one shroud, two bodies would be, would be wrapped. And then he would ask which of these had more knowledge of the Qur'an. And then he would place the one who had more knowledge of the Qur'an first. So he put their bodies in that order. And then he وسلم, said, I will testify for these people on the Day of Judgment. Now what this shows is how poor the Muslims were. That they had to share a shroud between the bodies. And we mentioned earlier about Mus'ab. Ibn Umayr radiallahu an, that he had only one cloak that he left behind and that is what they used to wrap him in even though it didn't cover his whole body and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ordered that these shuhada should be buried as they are meaning they should not be washed and then he stood over their bodies and he said, I am a witness over them. Shroud them in their blood, for there is no one who is wounded while fighting in the path of Allah, except that he will come on the day of judgment with his blood coming out, having the color of blood, but the fragrance of musk. Also, there was no janazah for them. No salah. Because, number one, the shaheed is not dead. And number two, because the shaheed does not need our dua. He doesn't need our salah. Everyone else, when they depart from this dunya, they're leaving with a lot of burden, a lot of sins. And so they need our du'as for Allah to have mercy upon them, to forgive them, and so on and so forth. But the shaheed, Allah has already forgiven him. Now, although this life of the shuhada is something unseen, and it is a different kind of life to our life in this dunya, Allah wanted to show the companions the truth of what He told them. And so many years later, after the death of the Prophet wasallam, in the Khilafah of Muawiyah عن, he was about to dig a canal close to the graves of the shuhada of Uhud. And so he made an announcement that anyone who had a relative that was killed at Uhud should come and be a witness. And so this canal, it might end up cutting through some of the graves. And so he wanted the relatives of the deceased to be there so that they can point out, you know, whose grave it was and then move it if necessary. Jabir radiallahu anhi says, A man came to me and said, O Jabir, some of Muawiyah's workers have uncovered your father's body and part of him is outside of the grave.
So Jabir radiallahu an, he goes and he says, when we brought out the body, I found my father in his grave, lying as if he was sleeping unchanged. We also found that his companion in the grave, remember, every shroud was with two people. His companion in the grave was Amr ibn Jamuh, one of the shuhada that we mentioned. He says, Amr ibn Jamuh, he had his hand over a wound, and when we moved his hand, it started to sprout out blood. Jabir radiallahu anhu, he says, We brought these bodies out as if we had only buried them yesterday. Ibn Kathir, he says, And it is said that the grave of each of them also had let out a fragrance. The smell of musk. So fragrance, blood, the bodies unchanged. How long later was this? We're talking about in the time of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. After the era of the four khulafa, 46 years later, it was as if they had just been buried, their wounds looked fresh, and the scent of musk was still coming out from their graves. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show the companions the truth of what he had told them. And so this is where we'll stop. We'll move on to the lessons that we learn from what we mentioned today. <clears throat> the first of the lessons is the question of who is a shaheed and who is not? We mentioned earlier that the definition of the shaheed is the one who is killed fi sabilillah, in the path of Allah, meaning he dies fighting for Islam, for the sake of Allah, for the sake of the deen of Allah. The proof of this, the Prophet wasallam, a Bedouin came to him, and he said, O Messenger of Allah, a man he fights for the sake of the booty, the spoils of war. Another man he fights for the sake of fame. And a third man he fights to show off. Which of them is fighting fi sabilillah? So the Prophet ﷺ said, The one who fights li'ala'i kalimatillah, the one who fights so that the word of Allah, meaning Islam, be high, he is the one who is fighting in the path of Allah. However, here it's important to note that we don't know what's in the hearts of men. We don't know who is fighting for what reason. Right? That's, only, that's something that only Allah is aware of. And so we go based on the apparent. And we leave what we don't know, what we cannot see, to Allah. So whoever fights and is killed on the battlefield, then we treat him like a shaheed. In terms of the rulings that we mentioned earlier. No ghusl, no salah, they're buried in their wounds, etc. And we ask Allah to accept them as shuhada even though we don't know how Allah will treat them. And next week, we'll come across a story of one of the people who was killed in the battle of Uhud from the side of the Muslims, but yet the Prophet ﷺ said, he is in the hellfire. The second lesson that we learn is that victory is not just victory on the battlefield in this dunya. Yes, that is a victory that the Mujahideen aspire for, that they aim for, and they do everything that they can to achieve it. But for those who are trying and they fail, 
and victory goes to the enemy, it doesn't mean that they have lost. The greater victory is the victory of the Akhirah. And that is why the Shuhada are rewarded the way they are. Likewise, if the Muslims are victorious on the battlefield and many fall as shuhada and now the Muslims are celebrating and enjoying the reward of their victory in this dunya it doesn't mean that the shuhada are missing out on that celebration no in fact they are celebrating a greater victory number three we do not commemorate historic days in our history, whether good or bad. We don't set days and say every year on this day we will celebrate this. Or the opposite, that if we are defeated, we're going to make this the day in which we mourn over those who were killed. It's a day of grief. And so some of the best people, some of the prophets were slain. And here we have Hamza radiallahu an, who was killed and his body was mutilated. And we know how grieved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was by his death. Yet, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not take that day as a day of sorrow or a memoriam where on the anniversary of that day we would get together and mourn you know whoever died on that day and so this is something that the Shia do for the killing of al Hussein radiallahu an even though Ali ibn Abi Talib his father was also was also unjustly killed and his son Hussein radiallahu an survived after him for 21 years and yet he Hussein radiallahu an did not hold any sort of memorial for his father nor have the Shia ever done for Ali radiallahu an like they do for Hussein even though Ali radiallahu an is better than his son according to both of us according to us and the Shia but it just shows you that the people of Bid'ah they will follow their whims and their desires and not the truth the fourth lesson that we learn is that good deeds erase Bad deeds. It was mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Wahshi after he heard his story. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Wahshi, Now go and fight in the path of Allah as you fought against the religion of Allah. And so that is how it is in Islam. If you commit a sin, then make up for it by doing a good deed. Because good deeds erase the evil ones. And this is part of our tawbah, our repentance, and how we should approach our sins. And this reminds us of a hadith. You know, th this exact scenario of Hamza radiallahu an and Wahshi the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says that Allah laughs at two men one of them killed the other and yet both of them enter Jannah the first is killed by the other while he is fighting in the cause of Allah and thereafter Allah will turn in mercy to the second to the killer and guide him to Islam, and then he dies as a shaheed fighting in the cause of Allah. 
So, what did Wahshi do? After the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wahshi, he said, I need to make up for what I did. And so he joins the army that went, in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, the army that went to fight Musaylama al kadhab He was a false prophet. After the Prophet sallallahu passed away, there were several people who claimed that we are prophets. And he was the main figure, Musaylama al kadhab Wahshi went in that army that laid siege to Musaylama al kadhab and he says, I looked for him, and then I took my spear, the same spear that I had killed Hamza with. And I saw Musaylama standing, sword in hand, while on the other side, there was another Muslim trying to attack him, trying to attack Musaylama. So I steadied my spear until I felt good about it, and then I let it loose on him, and it struck him. While the other Muslim, who was trying to attack him from the other side, he hit Musaylama with his sword and killed him. So it was Wahshi who struck him first, and the other Muslim struck him next. The question is, who was the other Muslim? Who killed Musaylama with his sword? The hero in the battle of Uhud, Abu Dujana, who was given the sword of the Prophet Remember last week we spoke about the story of Abu Dujana. In the beginning of the battle, the Prophet said, who will take this sword from me? And everyone wanted it. But then the Prophet said, who will take it and fulfill its right? And so it was awarded to Abu Dujana, who fought like a hero in that battle, killing anyone he met. Wahshi would say, it was me who killed him. And so I killed the best of men, and I also killed the worst of men. Meaning Hamza radiallahu an and Musaylama al kadhab The fifth lesson that we learn is sacrificing everything for Allah and His Messenger. And so in his last moments, Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah radiallahu an, he had asked Allah to reward Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember what he said? He said, go and convey to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this message that may Allah reward you on our account more than what Allah has rewarded any messenger for his people. And so, even though it was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that Sa'ad was dying for his sake. And so, Muslims today are stingy in giving their wealth and their lives for the sake of Allah. When harm comes to them, if they think that it is because of Islam, they will be willing to compromise on their deen just to protect their dunya. If we compare that to the companions, here the lives of the Ansar were wrecked. Imagine, they didn't have to do what they did by allowing the Prophet ﷺ to come and migrate to live with them in Medina. They could have saved themselves the hassle. But they did it. As a result, their lives turned around. Their business interests were in jeopardy. Their family suffered. They themselves suffered, such as in this battle. Their entire dunya turned upside down because of giving refuge to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Muslims, the Muhajirun from Mecca. Even then, 
Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah, he was asking Allah to reward the Prophet wasallam. And then he tells his people that as long as they have life in them, they will have no excuse in front of Allah. Even if Muhammad wasallam is pricked by a thorn. If Muhammad wasallam feels any pain while you are alive, then you are to blame. So this was his message to his people. So these were the Ansar. They were given that title, the helpers, Al-Ansar, which means the helpers, because they truly did help and give victory to the deen of Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The sixth lesson that we learn is asking Allah for shahada, asking Allah for to be killed fi sabilihi in his path. Abdullah ibn Jahsh, he made dua that he gets killed in the battle of Uhud, right? We mentioned that this was his dua, right? When he and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, each of them made a dua, his dua was, Oh Allah, let me to be killed. And that is exactly what ended up happening. This dua tells us that it is allowed for us to ask Allah for death only if it is in his path. The Prophet ﷺ says in Sahih Muslim, Whoever asks Allah for shahada, for martyrdom, genuinely, bi sidqin, Allah will make him to reach the ranks of the martyrs. shuhada. Even if he dies on his bed. Even if he dies on his bed. And so this shows us that we should make this dua. Imam al-Nawawi, he says, this is proof that asking for shahada and intending good is mustahab, it is encouraged. And so this is a dua that we should ask Allah for. Even if we're not able to fulfill it, even if we're not able to go and fight and be killed for Allah. As long as we make that dua sincerely from our heart, then as the Prophet ﷺ says, because of our good intention, Allah will raise us to that rank, the rank of the shuhada, even if we die on our bed. However, this is different than asking for death without it being on the battlefield. The Prophet ﷺ says, no one should wish for death. No one should wish for death. Either he is a doer of good and will do more in his life, or he is a doer of evil, and so perhaps he will stop. Meaning we should not wish for death no matter how tough life becomes. The Prophet ﷺ forbade that. And this is the only exception. This is the only exception. Wishing to die as a shaheed. Finally, one last point that we can mention is preferring the akhirah over the dunya. We see this in all of the stories of the Sahaba who participated in both the battles of Badr and Uhud. But especially in the story of who? This particular point of Preferring the akhirah over the dunya. In the story of Hamdala radiallahu anhu. Even though Hamdala just got married, he eagerly went to battle the next morning. And he didn't just go to show that he was there. But he, brought, he fought bravely until he died as a shaheed. In fact, his wife says that she saw a dream. 
she saw a dream where the heaven opens up and then it suddenly closes. And so she interpreted that to mean that Hamdullah will go and fight and he will be killed. Now, in conventional armies of the world, what does the state have to do when there's a war? They have to force people to come and show up. Right? They have conscription, mandatory service in the army. But here you have not just Hanvala, but all of the companions who are rushing forward. And even those who are excused. And we mentioned examples of those. In fact, even Hanvala, if he was to say, Ya Rasulullah, I just got married, can I be excused? Perhaps he would have been excused. But yet, he gave up his dunya. And, you know, brothers who are married, you know, if they go back to the day that they got married, they would know how attached they are to the dunya. And they know where their desires are. And they will not give that up for anything else. And yet here we have a beautiful example of how the companions preferred what Allah had in store for, for them over, over the temporary pleasure of this dunya. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us that desire. And with that we come to the end of the session. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astawfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa salli allahumma wa sallim ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.